spoke of it was Miss Candace Cooper when I came across her last year. Um, she was supposed to speak at my event last year, and unfortunately, she had a previous engagement, so she said she couldn't come through. But in November, after my event last year, I said, mm -hmm. I got you. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's here. She's amazing. I'm excited to hear her message. She shared a little bit with us on 106 Live um, earlier in the week, but um, today she's going to give it to us, and I'm excited to hear her message. So come on down, Miss Candace Cooper. Love it. Hello everyone, how are you doing this afternoon? Good, good. I'm sorry I have to have talking notes because I'm so passionate about this topic. I'll go off on a tangent and go and go and go, so I want to make sure that I am providing everyone with the information that I did want to share. Um, as uh, Ms. McKenzie said, you know, she found me on LinkedIn and uh, just a beautiful spirit, a sweet lady. And you know, initially I had a presentation that I had to do last year, so unfortunately it conflicted with the schedule here. So I'm so happy that I had the opportunity to speak this year for this amazing event because this is something, um, not only professionally, is my um, area of expertise. Um, I am the therapist and owner of New Creation Psychotherapy Services in Fayetteville, and my specialty is in domestic violence, sexual abuse assault. Um, I also work with um, violent couples, um, not intimate terrorism where it's power and control, but couples who don't have uh, the best conflict resolution skills to work with each other. So in my field, I'm a marriage and family therapist, and the first thing they say is you do not work with those couples. But I also think about the situations where couples, where both male and I'm privileged and heterosexual couples, uh, male and female in those situations are violent with each other. And then even in that, it's a safe, you know, you have to be safe and careful with those things. So I did want to um, start off by thanking God first and foremost, because if it was not for him, I would not be here. And Sian for giving me this opportunity, and my amazing husband, uh, Freddie Levin, for accompanying me and being my support system. <laughs> so I did want to start by sharing the narrative um, during my doctoral program, I had did a dissertation which focused on African Americans who witnessed domestic violence as low income youth and its impact on self identity and development. So I did want to share a narrative um, that participant had shared with me during my <coughs> dissertation studies. I'll start. I'm a 29 year old, educated, middle class African American female who comes from a lower class family background. During my childhood and adolescent years, I witnessed intimate partner violence between my parents. During my master's program, I engaged in intense self-work in which I realized that I had residual effects from witnessing intimate partner violence between my parents. I struggled with low self-esteem, low self-worth, rage, voicelessness, no hope for happiness, and trusting men. Trusting men was my biggest issue. I also struggled with issues related to being African-American and female. There were not enough messages or experiences affirming that as an African-American girl or woman, I was beautiful and worthy of love and respect. This further fueled my feelings of low self-esteem and self-worth. Although improved, I still struggled with self-worth and self-esteem. I struggled with finding my power in my voice and believing that I have, what I have to offer is worthy and important. I believe that cumulative experiences of witnessing intimate partner violence, being African American, and being a woman have contributed to my internal struggles. Reflecting upon my experience of witnessing intimate partner violence, I discovered the household and the neighborhood in which I grew up had an important impact on the extent to which I was exposed to intimate partner violence. My parents struggled during that time, and there was a lot of stress due to the lack of finances and resources. For the most part, my mother was the only one working. So my father did not contribute financially. My father had a gambling problem. I remember his gambling caused a lot of stress because my sisters and I did not have necessities such as clothing, shoes, school supplies, etc. His gambling affected important family traditions such as Christmas. My father's gambling was a source of conflict between my parents along with other issues such as control and power, which my father needed to have over my mother. We lived in a low income neighborhood where there was a lot of community violence. In my neighborhood, it was common for couples to fight physically. I remember witnessing physical fights in the street between heterosexual couples and no one did anything about it. 
At the time, I thought physical conflict was normal and did not understand how it was potentially harmful once to my development and my identity or my community. That story was my story. I had to present that during my dissertation defense. Um, and it got very emotional for me because one of my uh, committee members asked me, um, once they announced me as Dr. Cooper, I was so happy after that moment, but he asked me, the people you interviewed, they were you, so how did you make it? I completely broke down. And I said, through the grace of God, I feel like this is truly a calling, and this is my why. Um, because it's also a generational thing in my family, starting from my great-grandmother. Stories that my grandmother would tell me, she tried to help my great-grandmother in a domestic dispute between her husband, who wasn't her father. He broke her jaw when she was 10 years old. Started there, my grandmother being abused from there, my mom and my aunts from there, from the generation in my uh, family, my cousins and my sisters. So for me, this is something that I really uh, believe is, is critical and that I've, I've put out there the importance of seeking mental health as it relates to intimate partner violence because there's so many residual effects that take place, not only for the survivors, but also for the children, for their families, for their parents, for their siblings, the people that love them who are also affected by it. So it's a community thing. So I'm very stress-based in my approach. I believe in uh, positive thinking, positive psychology. And so with survivors that I work with, um, you know, a lot of times we know that they're affected by post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a common uh, disorder when it comes to dealing with intimate partner violence and becoming a victim and a survivor. There's also depression. There's also anxiety and just as you shared, having suicidal thoughts. But there's not a narrative of strength and positivity and growth that comes with that. So there's a phenomenon um, called post-traumatic growth. And basically, and let me give you the exact definition. Um, and post-traumatic growth, one second, is the development of a positive outlook following a trauma. It represents a change for the better following adversity. It drives the survivor to make positive meaning making from the event. So that's different than resiliency. Resiliency is I got through, I got through it in spite of it. Post-traumatic growth is saying I got stronger and tougher because of it. So because this happened to me, it made me more powerful, it made me stronger, it made me realize my worth and my value because this happened. And I was telling uh, Sonia and uh, Ms. Shantika and Felix uh, the other day on Monday, I used an analogy of the China Bowl in China when you know they don't throw the bowls away when they start to crack they line those cracks with gold. And so that's how I think about post-traumatic growth when it, becomes, uh, when it comes to survivors. So I wanted to address kind of the difference in mindset, because it's all about mindset change. So to me, you know, when you're in, um, I call it victim mode and survivor mode. And so a lot of the people that I serve coming into the door is in victim mode, which is natural, which is gonna happen because of all of the things that they have experienced as a result of being in a domestic violence relationship. So, and I'll just go over a few characteristics. Some of the things that not everyone may experience, but at some point has um, just more or less brokenness, feeling of worthlessness, feeling broken, uh, feeling torn apart, like, you know, um, situations where they felt they deserved what they got in that sense. So the sense of self-worth and self-esteem is, is crushed. Um, loss of control and authority over life, feeling like things happen to me. I, I'm not as empowered, I'm, I'm more, the world is not a safe space. Everything is dangerous to me. I'm trying, I can, it's difficult for me to discern what's dangerous, what's not dangerous, what's healthy, what's not healthy. Uh, feelings of um, lack of self-love, which I address, and everything, and hopelessness. Things won't get better, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and you know, I had a client where she, everything was darkness for her, everything. Everything was darkness, everything was chaos. Even when things started to get better for her, every week she had a new, a new chaotic story. I said, so at what point do you take accountability for the chaos that's being designed into your life? Mm -hmm. So, and that's when she kind of came to it. She was like, you know what, I think I do, I like chaos. Because I don't know how to, she was in a domestic violence relationship in a marriage for 20 years. So she didn't know how to be outside of that. So, and, and there was a lot of changing and shifting mindset. So survivor mindset characteristics. Kind of to the contrary, um, 
feeling a sense of control, a sense of safety that you have, you dominate your space. That's like, you know, things happen, granted, but I have control of what happens in my life to the best of my ability. It doesn't excuse the behaviors of others who impact or push themselves upon me, but that I have a sense of control and empowerment. Take your responsibility and accountability for your life. I think in the movie, I don't know if any of you have seen, uh, for, I think it was for Colored Girls, but it was a scene, she was in a domestic violence situation and he killed her kids, um, who am I doing, and they slipped out of his hands. And you know, she was beating herself up about it and uh, I forgot the character, thanks for Alicia shot. But she told her, take accountability for your part in this situation. And once she said that, she, you know, she gasped, like she finally agreed for the first time in months. So I think it's a piece of that. It doesn't excuse the behavior by any means. However, if I'm ending up, if I'm in a couple, like, violent relationships, violent, 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 and I've had a lot of clients who've been in several, after a while I was like, okay, what is, what is the thing, not excusing them, but what is the thing that is allowing, how am I teaching them to treat how am I teaching them to teach, treat me? I'm sorry, it's a tongue twister. But it's, and that's an important piece of like, how do I treat myself? And by how I treat myself is how I expect others to treat me. But if I don't love myself, if I don't care about myself, then my expectations of how people treat me and how I teach them, they get a blueprint. Like, that's okay, once again. And I have to keep prefacing that it does not excuse their behaviors. Self-love, affirmation, and happiness. Um, I feel that as human beings, we are responsible for our own happiness. It's no one's job to make us happy by ourselves. They can add to it, they can take away from it, but they are not responsible for it. And so having my own happiness or having your own happiness is a part of that piece. Like, who am I? What makes me happy? And I feel like, you know, um, as, you know, men too, and I don't want to um, shut down men in this context, but as women, um, I remember doing a workshop a while ago asking, who are you? No one can answer the question. You know, because we get so lost in things, especially when you become a parent, we become a wife, or a spouse, or a significant other, we lose ourselves. So what makes me happy? Uh, Self-forgiveness is a big piece in which a lot of you um, women have shared that if I can't forgive myself, I can't forgive anyone else. And like you shared earlier that if God can forgive us, I need to be able to forgive myself as well as those who have hurt me. And it's from a sense of freedom of self. It's for me to release you from my life and release the pain that has held me captive for so long. And I just uh, use it, I use a lot of analogies, but as a, um, I use an analogy of a jail cell. That person out there is, is free. I'm locked in jail and I need the key. I have the key to get myself out. I just need to know that it's on me. So um, that's a big piece that can uh, release as well as self-respect, which kind of is the thing of teaching people how to treat you. If I treat myself with respect, with dignity, with love, with self-care, then of course people, they're gonna, they're gonna exude that. That is the expectation, that is the standard, and people know that. And so I think those things are also the pieces, that survival mindset. So how do we get there? Um, my theoretical orientation, I'll try to put it as basic as I can because uh, it sounds a little complicated when I try to use it the other way. But I'm a my, based in narrative therapy. So the type of therapy was all about storytelling. It's all about sharing the testimony, okay. sharing the story. And it's a big piece, of, a groundbreaking moment in therapy where we do a trauma narrative. And during this narrative, they had to talk about piece by piece what happened to them. What were their thoughts? What were their feelings? What were their actions? And by doing so, it creates empowerment. It's sharing the story. It's like, okay, we have your chapter one. What's chapter two now? How do we recreate that narrative for you? Because when we, I believe, we create stories about ourselves. And how we create those stories is how we navigate and do relationships in our lives. So if I create a new story about strength, about being vibrant, you know, about um, being strong, being empowered, having a voice, what does that do for my life? I will engage and interact with others very much differently then I would carry in the narrative of I'm a victim, I'm broken, I'm lost, I'm hopeless. <clears throat> so the goal is to change that, but first starting off with the original narrative. So in doing that, I just think about, you know, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church up in New York, but he was from the South, <laughs> past him, and my grandmother is too. And we talked about, you know, testimonies. You know, everybody <laughs> goes, somebody, who got a testimony this Sunday, you know? <laughs> so, you know, in that moment, I, I find those things to be the most powerful things 
because not only is the person delivered, I feel like the moment you share a story, it's kind of like you're delivered from it because I'm able to actually say it out loud. Mm -hmm. So not only is the person delivered, but you never know who in the audience is also being delivered. And I tell my clients, I have a client to this day, and I tell them, your story is so powerful. You need to share your story. You never know what that story is going to do for someone else to give them hope, to say, hey, you know what? I went through this as well, but it's okay to make me stronger and maybe more um, more likely to think about things a little bit differently. I'm more aware of things, and I can also share and be a help to someone else. So usually, in the context, when you're thinking about post-traumatic growth, it's changing your mindset, it's changing how you view um, the, the event, the meaning making out of it, how things are prioritized in your life now after the event. Um, also, the piece around having a spiritual foundation. It's not to say it has to be Christian, but once again, it's just having a solid foundation of a higher power in your life to kind of help you make sense out of or grow out of uh, your experience. And lastly, is having the support system to kind of help you uh, through that. Because usually, especially with um, survivors, the first thing I ask is, who is your support? Because when you don't have the support, it makes things much more difficult, but having those trusted people in your life, in your circle, uh, to help you through it, because it's not an easy process getting through, and just watching um, as a child, and even my own process, of having to make meaning and make sense out of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And one of my professors, I was telling him, I was like, I had the keynote in October, and he was like, you know, I was waiting for you to find your voice, because you have so much power, but you don't believe it for yourself. And the moment you do, is when you will be amazing. And so, you know, and he always got on me about that because I always did have that sense of voicelessness of I'm not competent enough, I'm not good enough, but it took some soul searching to realize, you know what, it's needed. And this is a calling that, though a di difficult topic that a lot of people don't like to discuss, is very needed and very necessary. And someone, especially in the, in the mental health world, I, people ask me, you know, what I uh, specialize in, I tell them, I'm like, ooh, oh yeah, you can, <laughs> you can have that, you know, and it's really difficult work, but it's very powerful, very healing work. So my tagline in my practice is to, to promote healing, empowerment, and transformative growth. And that's what I'm all about the growth. Uh, and, and wanted to acknowledge the pain, but also acknowledging how we grow from that pain. And so I'll leave it off with a quote, because I'm really sure I'll go over time. Um, and this is a growth, a uh, quote that's very um, simple but powerful. For a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insides come out, and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it will look like complete destruction.